worship this morning with our opening prayer. As we gather here in the harbor of your safety, we thank you for fellowship and family. We ask that you will strengthen us, restore us, and inspire us with your love. Lord, would you fill us with your peace, so that as we journey onwards, we would pour out your love and grace to others. We ask that our souls would catch the wind of your spirit, so that we would take your promises to all the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's stand for opening hymn number two. Joyful, joyful, we adore you. Let's stand here to sing hymn number two. Let us pray. Dear God, we come to you today to give thanks for the gift of life and the many blessings that you give us. Today we reflect upon the image of the living stone that you have given us in your word. We are reminded that just as stones are used to build strong and enduring structures, so too are we called to be living stones in your spiritual house. Help us be strong and steadfast, steadfast in our faith, rooted in your love and grace, and able to withstand the storms of life. And as we go about our daily lives, may we be examples of your love and light, shining brightly in the darkness and pointing others towards you. May we be a source of strength and encouragement to those around us, building up the spiritual house of your kingdom. We pray for those who are struggling to find their place in this world, for those who are lost or hurting. May they find their footing in you, the living stone. May they discover the purpose and meaning of their lives through your life. And finally, we pray that you may continue to mold and shape us into the people you want us to be letting us be instruments of your peace and love in this hurting world. Now, let us pray together the prayer that Christ taught his disciples so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And after our special music, we would invite any children in the worship to meet Susan, who will be playing for us in the back for Children's Church. First and Second Peter are some of the most complicated books in the New Testament. The Greek vocabulary in First and Second Peter is complex and highly educated, as well as the overall themes that you find in those two books. They don't seem like they were written by a fisherman. In fact, from what we know about Peter, it seems like he probably couldn't read or write much, if any, at all. Now, Peter was able to speak in Pentecost with tongues he could not know. So it is true that maybe the Spirit gave him a, leg a level of education that he otherwise did not possess. But also... We know in the New Testament that at certain times, the apostles wrote with the assistance of others. 
uh, educated scribes would sit down and write their ideas into the written word. Uh, many scholars believe here in 1 Peter that took place. Often a man named Silas is presumed to be the scribe. He was a disciple of Peter and Paul. And I think that if that's the case, if someone who learned from Peter wrote these words, then it makes the ideas of Peter, the ones that he expresses here in 1 Peter, well, even more complete. So let's read today from Peter's first less, uh, letter, Chapter 2, verses 2 through 10. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now, to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him whom called you, who called out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The word of the Lord. In our Gospels, Peter is called the rock of the church. Before Christ's passion, he tells Peter that on him, Peter as a rock, Jesus will build his church. Which is interesting, because here in this letter, Peter refers to Jesus as the cornerstone. So how can Peter be the rock of the church, but Jesus the cornerstone? Now, I know what a cornerstone is, because, well, it's in the name, isn't it? It's a stone in a corner. But I didn't realize that in classic masonry, it's more than just the stone in the corner. It's the very first stone that the mason lays. And the rest of the house or the building is measured off of that cornerstone. If you were to build a house that was 10 yards by 10 yards, you would measure those 10 yards off that cornerstone. The entire building is built in respect to that single stone. A cornerstone cannot be laid after the building has been built. It has to be the very first stone. And you can't change your cornerstone halfway through. The cornerstone has always been the cornerstone. But it's only one rock. Another rock is built after it, and another one after it, building off each other one by one, becoming a living building as it's built to completion. And that makes a little bit of sense, right? There's a church in New York City, St. Mark's in the Bowery, it is the oldest church with a continuous worship service in the United States. Uh, since 1795, they have been worshiping in the exact same site. That's when the cornerstone was first laid in their building, and they began to meet later that year there. 
There's only been two times where they have not met in person in that building. That was during the Spanish flu and during COVID. It's the only times that people were not meeting in that church. Now, it's seen a lot of changes over the years. Uh, when it was first incorporated by Alexander Hamilton himself, it was the largest building in the area. It was actually on the outskirts of New York City, surrounded by farms and little cottages. Today, well, there's no cottages around it. It, it once towered over the other buildings, and now it's dwarfed by skyscrapers. In 1970, a fire took uh, hold of a large section of the building. The entire interior and the roof burned to ashes. But the rock walls, they stayed. That cornerstone that was laid in, in 1795 is still there. And if we were in New York City right now, there'd be a group of people, just like us, meeting in that church. Living stones. I doubt anyone in that church has family members who originally started that church in 1795, but there's an unbroken chain of members leading back to that very first worship service. And the same is true with our gospel reading. If Peter didn't write this letter, if someone else transcribed his ideas, that's a chain from Christ to Peter to the scribe. And in our lives, we too have that unbroken chain. Every Christian can trace their faith back to Jesus. Jesus taught his disciples, who taught people, who taught people, who taught people, who taught you. Jesus taught someone that taught you your faith. We all are built off that cornerstone. But we're living stones, too. This morning, I was picking up some trash in the parking lot on my way in. Uh, it was derby last week, or yesterday, and I guess some people decided to party in our parking lot. So I got to clean that up on my way in this morning. But that meant that I walked in the kitchen entrance over there by the trash cans. And, and as I walked in and I thought about the very first service, over in that old part of the church, because that was the original church building down there. And I thought actually about Bill, there he is, maybe walking in that same entrance on a Sunday, getting ready for his sermon. And I thought about whoever would come after me, maybe 40 years from now, walking in that same entrance, because as I walked in today, I saw the renovation under, underway, and I thought, in 40 years, will someone be walking in this same door, seeing a new renovation take place? Uh, the floor we put, after 40 years, will it be replaced? And will someone else be meeting in this church? An unbroken chain of people coming and worshiping in this facility. We may not be as old as uh, St. Mark's in the Bowery, but we have a history nonetheless of people coming here looking forward to a future. And we know that people in the future will look forward to the future once again. Each stone built off the last, building the house that we now worship in. And an infinite loop of teachers and students, of followers and leaders, and all children of God. So as we continue on with our week, I want you to think about how you can be a living stone. How can you help someone else to grow in their faith so that they can help someone after you? So that we can continue to build this chain of followers and believers in the love of God 
so that those little babies crying in the background <laughs> can it someday be the elders in this church. And they can hear a little baby cry too. What can we do to be the living stones that Christ needs? Now, will you pray with me? Almighty Lord, we thank you. We thank you for being that first cornerstone. Uh, that stone which we are built off of. Uh, knowing that rock will not fall come fire or, stone or storm, it will continue to sit there, to grow and, and be a monument to your greatness. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done in our lives so far and all that you will continue to do. We pray this in your Son's holy and great name. Amen. Let us stand as we sing him 564, He Touched Me. Let us stand as we sing him 564. <laughs> That last supper was Jesus and 12 men gathered in a room. That's all it was. Since that last supper, people like us have gathered around this same table. Those 12 have spread into hundreds, into thousands, into millions, into billions. Christians coming together and celebrating this meal. So as we join around the table today, let us connect just with, not just with the people here, but with Christians around the world, the Christians that have come before us and the Christians that will come after us and celebrate our unity with Christ. For in the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread, having blessed it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body given to you, do this in remembrance of of me. And in a like manner, after supper, he took the cup, and having blessed it, he poured it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, drink of this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant of my blood, given to you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are indeed privileged together at your table to partake of this symbolic meal of bread and wine. 
May we do this in a manner acceptable in your sight. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. And Jesus said, You may not know this about uh, Cody, but he's actually been playing around the city all weekend. In fact, I heard he's playing in the airport later today. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we get to hear his wonderful musical talent here as his way of offering something to us and to Christ. We all have different gifts. You don't want to hear me behind that piano. But we all have something we can give to help build up this spiritual house of God here on this corner. So as we listen to his wonderful gift, let us think about the gifts we have, how we can help build upon the rocks that came before us and leave something for the people who come after. Thank you.
Cody didn't know I was going to mention him during the offertory in a moment. Uh, I'm sure it put a little bit of pressure on him, but he did a fantastic job with that pressure. Just thank you so much for offering your gift to us. If you've been worshiping with us for a while and you feel the love of God here in this house, then I invite you to come forward and either reaffirm your faith or make the confession for the very first time that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that you accept him as your Lord and Savior as we sing our hymn of response, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. Let's stand as we sing hymn 559. All the Way My Savior Leads. Let's stand as we sing hymn 559. I'd like to thank you for worshiping with us today. Now let us close in prayer. Now may the Spirit of God surround you. May the peace of God be in your heart. And may you share that peace with each and every person you meet. Amen.